Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Politics and COVID-19, Where Do We Go From Here? We have a wonderful program in store for you today. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and circulated to all participants after the webinar. Additionally, should you have any questions that you'd like to submit to the panel, you may submit them through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'd now like to introduce you to today's moderator, Eric Tannenblatt, the Global Chair of Denton's Public Policy and Regulation Practice. Thank you, Nicole, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, Politics and COVID-19. Uh, we're going to have a discussion on the impact COVID-19 is having on our national, state, and local politics. Uh, this is part of a broader series of webinars that we are hosting at Denton's uh, and have been throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, as Nicole indicated, I'm Eric Tannenblatt, Global Chair of Public Policy and Regulation at Denton's, and I'll serve as the moderator for today's discussion. I'm delighted uh, to be joined by four of my colleagues at Denton's who are not only real leaders uh, in the public policy space, but also uh, leaders in U.S. politics. And so it's a pleasure for me to introduce Governor Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont, former chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and former uh, candidate for president of the United States. Uh, Ron Kaufman, who's the current treasurer of the Republican National Committee and the treasurer for the 2020 Republican National Convention and former White House political director. Mayor Michael Nutter, who's the former mayor of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, he was recently the co-chair of Michael Bloomberg's recent presidential campaign and is currently a member of the Democratic National Committee Rules and Bylaws Committee. And Polly Lawrence. Polly's a former state representative from Colorado. She also served as the House Republican Whip and the Assistant Minority Leader in the Colorado General Assembly. To kick off our discussion, I wanted to frame the landscape uh, exactly two months ago to this day, uh, President Trump declared a national emergency. Uh, so that at, at, at that time, all 50 states, or since that time, all 50 states uh, at some point sheltered in place. Uh, we've had over 1.4 million cases of COVID-19, uh, over 80,000 deaths. The number of states are starting, a number of states are starting to ease their restrictions and slowly open up. Uh, we're experiencing as a country historic unemployment. Several industries are in dire straits, such as the airline industry, which has seen a 90% decline. Uh, Congress has passed uh, four COVID-related bills, uh, with the CARES Act being the most significant to date with over $2 trillion of spending. And then yesterday, uh, the House unveiled the HEROES Act, uh, with another uh, $3 trillion, excuse me, uh, proposed. And so while all this is going on, we also have an election in the background. Uh, Joe Biden is now our presumptive Democratic nominee. Uh, we have 35 U.S. Senate races, uh, the entire House of Representatives, governor's races, and state and local camp uh, elections all across the country. So to kick us off, uh, and to start our conversation, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share their thoughts on, on how they feel COVID-19 has impacted politics today. And I'd like to start with Governor Dean and then ask uh, Ron Kaufman to follow him, followed by Mayor Nutter and then Polly. So Governor Dean. Sure, uh, just to, in, a, in a fine, to, not to put a fine point on this, uh, I, the president's credibility has been damaged significantly. Most people in this country do not believe that the president is handling this well. And they actually don't believe the president um, in many of his utterances about this problem. The governors have a, a, a lead in terms of favorability, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the highest in the country, interestingly, is a Republican, Mike DeWine, who's very conservative. Uh, but governors in general are uh, between 20 and 30 points more credible than uh, the president on this issue. So that doesn't help. I think what's really going to harm uh, the Trump and, and the Republicans in general in the election uh, is, however, the economy. Uh, this is not going to go away. Uh, I, you know, the, the amount of money we're pumping into this uh, in terms of what it's doing to the deficit is just shocking. 
Uh, but th that actually doesn't bother most Americans is the size of the deficit. What really bothers them is the unemployment rate, and that is not coming back anytime soon. We're going to see enormous uh, relocations and dislocations. Eric mentioned the airline industry, uh, the universities, the state of California just announced that 500,000 students were going to be uh, not on the campus uh, in coming the fall, and other universities were doing Brooklyn Law School apparently announced that as well. Uh, these are just going to be shocking. Commercial real estate, uh, why would we rent 10 floors in Washington if we, if we can get by with three, uh, even though Denton's has a long-term lease, so I don't anticipate any differences there. But the, but the numbers are just shocking. I actually believe we're going to take the Senate. I think there are eight or nine seats now that are at risk were before I would have said it was going to be a very close call, and I don't think that's the case anymore. Ron? Thanks, sir. Eric, uh, thank you, Governor, for that uh, junior advisor report. It's very good. Uh, the bottom line is uh, no one knows the real impact, Eric. It's going to happen in November. Uh, two months ago, Bernie Sanders was a nominee presumptive, and, and Vice President Biden was basically in the political slag heap. Uh, and today it's turned on its head. Um, elections are decided by two things re election campaigns. Uh, the president, should we hire him again or not? Two, what's the mood of the country? And I don't think anybody right now knows what the mood of the country is going to be. Of course, the president's numbers aren't well now. Uh, we've had 20 million people uh, sign up for unemployment. Businesses are closed down. The mood is not good. Of course, the president's numbers have dipped. Not as much as I, not as much as I thought they would. I thought they'd dip more. Um, so it, it's, it's not a great climate for a president. Governors have the advantage of being closer to the people, in my opinion, and they know their state better, and all the governors pretty much are doing better than the president, as they usually do with these kind of situations. Um, and the public is kind of schizophrenic. There's always an old poll that always goes the same way. Um, do you want your congressman to do better in Washington? Overwhelmingly, the voters will say, yes, we want them to get the job done. They're not being done well now. Secondly, do you want the, the, your congressman to, in fact, compromise? Oh, no, never compromise. Just get things done. And that schizophrenia is happening now. I think everyone wants to be safe and healthy. At the same time, they want to open up their shops and their stores so they can go back to work. And that's playing out pretty much differently in each state. And I think it's the right thing to happen. States will decide for themselves. And in the end, I think we'll get through this. And um, this election will be decided on the mood of the country uh, next November. And I have great faith that in the end, uh, the mood will be better. Uh, people will be working. The president will get reelected. And Mitch McConnell, much to Governor Dean's chagrin, will be the, the leader of the Senate uh, in two years. Mayor Nutter, do you agree? <laughs> and it was right off of the uh, right off of the talking points. Uh, we must have gotten the distribution just this morning. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, um, the uh, there is a reason that the governors and the mayors, uh, in particular as executives, are communicating with the public in much more direct, sane, uh, fact-based, data-based uh, manner, uh, and the public is responding, even in places as. Uh, uh, I think it's being shown on the news, even in places that have opened, uh, quote unquote, open, um, you know, many members of the public are still skeptical. Uh, the testimony just yesterday by the three leading health experts in the United States of America, all of whom testified remotely uh, because notwithstanding the president's pronouncements, uh, you can't even uh, keep the White House safe. Uh, and so everyone there now has to wear a mask. Why he refuses to wear one is beyond me. Uh, endangering other people, as he could, in fact, be a carrier. So um, the economies of cities and states are, in fact, being devastated uh, by the impact of COVID-19. It is uh, unfortunate uh, that the Congress, uh, after uh, Eric and your opening, um, you know, four different bills, uh, doing various uh, things that all were important, uh, but uh, when it came to uh, city and state support, uh, somehow the Congress and the uh, Trump administration said, oh, no, uh, we need to take a pause. 
Um, you know, now that's all politics. It's bare knuckle politics. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that people are hurting, uh, and um, that uh, those deficits are going to fall on the heads and the backs of people who can least afford it. Public employees uh, and uh, citizens are going to feel the impact of cuts to budgets, layoffs, uh, and an increase in taxes because somehow, some way, the Congress can't figure out, the Trump administration can't figure out that in now the worst recession since the Great Depression. During my time, we had the worst recession since the Great Depression. This is even worse. Uh, that cities and states uh, somehow don't need uh, support uh, from the federal government uh, at the worst possible time. Uh, so we'll see what happens with the bill that was introduced. But uh, overall, uh, the, the, from a pure political standpoint, this is bad, certainly for the president, uh, because he can't figure out how to tell the truth. Holly, your thoughts? Well, with parts of what my um, compatriots have just said, I would say that uh, when it comes to local governments, there is <laughs> there is um, a lot of need in the smaller communities. The CARES Act distributed money to the states, but a lot of I know in the case of Colorado, the state kept the majority of that money. They did not have it flow down to the smaller municipalities and counties around the state. So that is an ongoing issue. Um, when it comes to opening up the economy, we have people here who are ready to start working. There are people who want to get back to work and are anxious for the governors of the states to start opening up again. I think we'll see a change in the way business operates, but I think the unemployment rate will drop fairly quickly and people will get back to work. There's no doubt that there's going to be an economic impact across the country to the states when it comes to school finance and public transportation and the infrastructure that local governments and states are responsible for. But it's going to take create creativity on behalf of legislators and governors and recognizing that, you know, after the Great Recession, sometimes the mindset was, well, now we're going to be in good times forever. Let's start all these new programs. And unfortunately, this is one of those hard realities that economies go up and down and you can't always budget for up times. You have to be able to pull back on some of your programs and some of your wishes for your state because the economy is not always going to go up. Uh, this has been an extremely drastic decline in the economy. And um, I hope we recover from it quickly. I know the people in Colorado are ready to get back to work. Um, let, let's, um, if we can, let, let's, if we can, move to the vice presidential selection, because that, that seems to be something people are starting to focus more on. And, and I think I'm going to address these to question, this question to Governor Dean and, uh, and Mayor Nutter. Um, can you comment about the selection process? that uh, um, uh, Vice President Biden has put in place. Uh, and then anything you wanna share about some of the names that are being you know, tossed around as uh, potential picks, starting with Governor Dean. I'll just it'll be quick. I, I don't find any what I would consider bad names on the list that are generally published. Um, I, at the pre I think uh, you know, Joe is an experienced public servant. He's been in the position the first is criteria is always somebody who can step in on a moment's notice. So you'd like them to have some significant political experience. I, of course, have a bias towards governors or CEOs uh, because that's what the job is. And it's a very different job than a senator, being a senator. Um, and so uh, I, I personally like the list of governors that he is looking at. Um, I know the vetting committee is going to be very tough. Uh, they're going to get every last income tax for form and, and a piece of information that is available uh, because the, what they don't want is to have this blow up. Having said all this, a the selection of a vice president has not made any difference to the uh, success or failure of a nominee since Lyndon Johnson uh, was Jack Kennedy's 
uh, vice president. I think Lyndon Johnson did bring Texas along, probably by a whole bunch of means, which would have not been considered quite <laughs> proper at the time, I'm suspecting. Um, but uh, since that time, it really doesn't make any difference who the vice president is. Very difficult uh, situation with McGovern and, and Eagleton, but that turned out not to make a difference. Um, and so, um, you know, this is important. It's important for the country. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thrilled that it's a woman because there are many women in the Democratic Party who felt that they had their candidate last time who did not succeed and should have and was in some way uh, cheated out of the presidency. And whether you think that's true or not, people feel strongly about that. So I, I'm delighted at that aspect of the choice and I'm pretty pleased with the field and we'll just have to see uh, what happens. Mayor Nutter? Yeah, I, I would certainly echo much of what uh, Governor Dean has laid out, but I, I do think that, um, yeah, and Vice President Biden has even articulated some of this, that um, I mean, we're at a, a bit of an inflection point, uh, I think, in the Democratic Party when you look at, um, and it is a great list, uh, and I think the committee that you put together, Vice President Biden put together, uh, is a great uh, committee. Um, but I think that, um, you know, some combination of, um, you know, who the vice president is, what his experience has been, his connection, of course, and relationship with President Obama, uh, and um, many of the candidates, uh, some of whom are women of color, uh, may have felt that after the first criteria, can you serve? If something were to happen, can you serve? It always has to be uh, the first criteria, but I mean, you can't, uh, you know, you can't uh, ignore uh, some of the other uh, uh, considerations, and certainly politics uh, being one of them. Uh, I think after the vice president's experience in South Carolina, the impact of uh, Mr. Clyburn and the African American community in particular, um, you know, a a combination of the vice president and potentially a woman of color uh, may in fact uh, have uh, an even greater impact on the electorate uh, and energizing a base uh, that is uh, looking for um, you know a dynamic duo uh, if you will and so that opportunity is there uh, but i'm sure the vice president and his team will figure out what's best for the country and the party let, let's move on to the national uh, nominating conventions, because obviously COVID-19 has uh, impacted the planning there. And, and Ron, why don't I start with you as the treasurer for the RNC convention uh, in Charlotte? How, how has COVID-19 impacted the planning for the convention and, and what's the current plan? Sure. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, we're going to have our convention uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's going to be the last week of August. Um, we've been working on it since for two years now, as the Democrats have. Uh, we've raised more money than we've ever raised before going into the convention. The host committees raised more. Uh, we helped get the $50 million grant for security through Congress earlier than ever before in history. Our planning process is about a month and a half ahead. So we feel really comfortable where we are as uh, going into the connection uh, in the last week in August. How that's actually gonna look, how big is it gonna be? We're gonna have 50,000 people or less. Um, how, many, how, how long will the convention be may change, uh, but we're gonna have a great convention in Charlotte. The mayor has been terrific and I have to, give a shout out to this great mayor of, of Charlotte, North Carolina, even though she's an unfortunate Democrat, she's a terrific mayor and, and, and a good leader. Uh, the people of Charlotte- You might want to support her. I, I do all the time. I, I almost send her a check, almost. <laughs> there. She's her, she supports us, which is really wonderful. Uh, I took a lot of heat for it. But we're, we're gonna have a great convention. And, and um, obviously it's gonna be a safe convention and more important than anything else, people are gonna go, have fun and come home healthy. And that's our goal, and I think we will do that. Governor Dean, uh, Mayor Nutter, why don't we start with Governor Dean and then uh, yeah. Mayor Nutter uh, sure, sure. at the Democratic Convention. Uh, sure. These, uh, both these states are swing states. I wouldn't want to be the person who uh, opened the door for the second uh, version of the epidemic. Uh, so I think both, both uh, despite the president's rhetoric, I think both conventions will be scaled back. I don't think either 
party will abandon these cities that have laid out all this incredible work and money. Uh, but I expect a significant part of the convention will be virtual for safety reasons. I, I do not expect that the conventions will be entirely virtual. I, unless there's an outbreak before uh, in these states, uh, before the convention starts, um, I, I suspect it'll be a combination of virtual, as, as Ron said, some cutbacks probably and may perhaps the number of nights uh, and, and making sure that there is social distancing on the floors of these conventions. The problem with this disease, of course, is that there's so many people that are asymptomatic that are carriers and spreaders. So there's not a chance that you could have 30 or 40,000 people uh, in a city uh, and 20 or 30,000 people in a convention hall without having two or 3,000 of them uh, have uh, be, be, be contagious. And uh, we have to uh, take that into effect and I'm sure we will. But I do believe there will be a physical presence in both cities uh, and there will be a fair amount of uh, virtualness as well. And it'll be some, a combination uh, of the two. But I, I would hope that the Democrats would not let down the city of Milwaukee after all they've done uh, for us. And I don't think the Republicans will let down Charlotte. Yeah, I think, uh, Eric, the, the only thing I would add, uh, I mean, Governor Dean has kind of covered that area. Um, it it uh, increasingly seems that there will be uh, some amount of uh, virtual convention, but I, I would raise a different point. Um, you know, it's, um, what are we at, May 13th? Um, who knows what will be going on July and August? Um, in Pennsylvania, we're still under stay at home through June. Uh, again, you listen to the testimony from yesterday. Uh, I think it was Ron, who, uh, or maybe it was Eric, mentioned a number of colleges and universities not allowing students uh, some already have announced students not coming back. Um, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. I don't know how you put that many people in any space. Uh, and in addition to the fact that people have to get there. So let me leave my house, go to the airport, which what will that be like? Get on an airplane, what will that be like? Go to a hotel, uh, get in a cab or you know whatever. Uh, so there are a number of steps before you ever end up uh, at a convention hall, that the, that the delegates and other people, participants, will have to decide for themselves, do I want to do that in the first place? And so the public, the, the engaged parties, also have a role to play here uh, in terms of how much risk uh, do you want to take? Uh, to have that level of participation. So I think we're, we're way, the cart is way before this horse uh, here in May talking about something in August. Well, this is a good segue though to talk about voting in general and, and Mayor Nutter, why you have the floor. How, how do you think uh, COVID-19 is going to impact the whole voting process? Well, um, you know, my wife and I have our, uh, we have our mail-in ballots, uh, which uh, uh, we're going to fill out, very secure. Um, you know, I guess the, uh, President Trump has already used uh, mail-in uh, while he rails against it, slightly contradictory uh, perspective. Um, but, you know, I think everyone needs to anticipate uh, to have a national election, which is going to take place on the day that it's supposed to take place. How do we help ensure that everyone uh, has access uh, to uh, the ability to vote? Uh, and uh, they again, may not want to go to a polling place in Pennsylvania, uh, which pushes this election back like many others. Uh, even some of the poll workers don't want to be at the polls. And so National Guard, not in uniform, uh, it's being discussed, may help to staff polling places just in you know, regular civilian uh, clothes. And so um, you know, the entire election uh, is changing. Uh, the president you know, can't really do his rallies like he likes to do. Vice President Biden is, you know, in the studio now in his basement. Um, not going to be a lot of door knocking uh, in this election. All the traditional things uh, campaigns have to figure out, uh, not just the president, but all the people who are running for office, um, uh, have to figure out how do you engage with voters in the most untraditional of ways and still run an election operation. So. Um, and help people with uh, with mail-in and the like. So a lot of challenges, uh, but I mean, look, this is America, we can figure it out. Holly, anything you wanna add with regards to voting? 
Oh, Colorado was the first state to have mail in ballots. That was passed in 2013 in the legislature. So we're very familiar with mail ballot operations and have found them to be pretty secure. We do have, um, I think we need stuff, signature verification. I know there have been some questions about that in the past and ballot harvesting certainly goes on when you have all mail-in ballots. So that's an issue that needs to be considered. Um, we have had virtual caucuses in Colorado because we are still a caucus state. Uh, but I think the election will go on. People are accommodating the changes. And because of the COVID, I think mail ballots are probably going to be necessary around the country just for the safety of, as Mayor Nutter said, the poll workers and the people who are actually there at, for the in-person voting that happens today. So uh, we're, we're so, actually uh, coming towards the end of time. So what I want to do is ask each of you to answer the same question. And I'm going to combine a couple things uh, together. But how has uh, COVID-19 impacted uh, the battleground states uh, and maybe some of the Senate races uh, that are, are very competitive. And um, Polly, since you have the floor, why don't we start with you since you actually are in one of those you states. Are in one of those. I am in one of those states. I believe Senator Cory Gardner might be the number one target for the Democrats this year. Um, not being able to go door to door and meet with constituents in person is definitely an obstacle when it comes to running for re-election or election in general. Uh, but I think Corey has done a phenomenal job of getting around the state. And he's also been voted the most bipartisan senator there is because he recognizes Colorado is a purple state and he can't just focus on the Republican voters. He has to focus on the issues that everyone in Colorado is concerned about. So I do think he's done an exceptional job at that. Um, the Democrat contest has narrowed down to Andrew Romanoff and John Hickenlooper. Um, Andrew is a former Speaker of the House. Hickenlooper is a former governor. So I think that's gonna be hotly contested and they are feeling the pinch of not being able to meet with their constituents in person. Although they both have pretty robust um, digital campaigns. So, it's going to be a very lively election season. Mayor Nutter, you're also in one of the battleground states. Yeah, um, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, we're incredibly purple uh, at times. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that there clearly were some lessons uh, learned and to be learned uh, from 2016. Uh, you know, as a Pennsylvanian, just embarrassing that uh, that we lost the election, 44,000 votes or so. Um, and um, but I think that uh, there are many lessons that have been learned. There are robust uh, activities uh, across Pennsylvania. Make sure people are registered to vote, that they participate in the upcoming primary, just to really quite honestly get ready uh, for uh, the general election. Uh, and so I'm feeling more and more optimistic uh, about Pennsylvania. Um, you know, my old football coach used to say, you know, guy dropped the ball. And he said, you know, coach. Paul was wet and he said, son, it's raining on both sides of the field. Uh, I think, you know, both candidates, uh, you know, people have to figure out this, you know, how do you campaign when you can't see people, when you can't interact with people? I mean, I've never had that experience. I mean, it's the most bizarre thing in the world, but uh, campaigns will have to have to figure it out. And then, you know, I'll give one little shout out to Ron. Um, you know, this will be fluid. Uh, from now through November, you know, what is going on with the economy? How many people have died? You know, what's the perception, local, state, and federal, of how this whole thing has been handled? And, and these are the forces uh, that will really drive uh, people to either come out in droves or just say, you know, does it matter? Governor Dean? Uh, you know, it's really early. Uh, to predict. Uh, I predict that, uh, that Collins will beat Loeffler in the primary in uh, Georgia. And whether we have then have a shot because he's so conservative in the suburbs may not play so well, but we don't know because we don't know who our candidate's going to be. Um, but I can tell you that that uh, uh, that uh, the, our candidate in Montana is ahead by seven, that our candidate in 
Um, Iowa is down by one uh, to Joni Ernst, who was thought to be invincible, that we are ahead in Maine, uh, that the Americans for, uh, uh, for Prosperity just dropped a multi-million dollars into John Cornyn's race. I don't have pollings on that, but you know, they don't, the Koch brothers don't waste money. Uh, so that tells me something about Texas and MJ Hager's possibilities as, as a challenger. Uh, I think we'll win in Kansas if, if the Democrats nominate, if the Republicans nominate Kobach, uh, because that's how we won the governorship. And we have a former Republican running as governor, as a senator candidate there. I mean, these are, these are seats that nobody thought we had a shot at. So I think we've got a shot at as many as nine or even 10 seats uh, in the Senate. Do I think we'll take them all? No. Do I think it's awfully early to be doing the war dance and a victory? Yes. Uh, everything is going to change, but I think we're in really, really good shape right now. If the election were held tomorrow, we wouldn't we win, and we'd have a four or five vote majority in the Senate. Well, Ron, just like the uh, the, the the last convention goes to the party who occupies the White House, we'll ha let you have the last word. Uh, well, I, I think that the Democrats in the Senate are about as good shape right now as Mrs. Clinton was four years ago. Um, there are big changes that happened because of all this. First, uh, in a tactical way, more than a, than a, than a uh, strategic way. In Massachusetts, uh, we cut down how many signatures you need to run uh, to get it. And we went for the first time ever, electronic signature gathering. And we got six candidates who weren't announced in a matter of two weeks on the ballot. And I think that it's gonna happen across the country for now and forever. Uh, in California, 25, a special election, uh, it was all uh, mail-in voting, and the Republicans turned out more than they ever had done before. It was the largest turnout in any special election in the country this year, and we won by eight points. Um, I think that, that uh, mail-in ball ball balloting is going to happen across the country, and I think it's going to end up helping Republicans more than Democrats' uh, prediction. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say something Mayor Nutter said that I think has been the most unreported important story that's going to change politics so far this year. I think Congressman Claiborne's speech endorsing um, uh, uh, Vice President Biden is going to change politics in a very positive way. Because what he did in that speech is make the, the minorities in, in South Carolina the force they should have been right along. I think across the country, it will honestly change the way politics is looked at. I think history is going to give the congressman a big shout out for making a huge difference. Well, thank you. And, and, and Ron, Polly, Governor Dean, Mayor Nutter, thank, thank all of you for participating. As anticipated, we could have gone on. There's, there's a lot to discuss on this topic. And as you all acknowledge, the landscape is, gonna, is going to continue to change. And I'd like to regroup in maybe another month and, uh, and get the group back together and have another conversation and perhaps uh, continue to do this through the uh, election season. I wanna thank yeah. all of those that are listening. Uh, invite you to visit our Denton's COVID-19 Client Resource Hub on our website at dentons.com, or you could subscribe to our policy and politics blog, Soapbox, at policysoapbox.com. I wanna wish you all a good balance of the day and thank you for listening. Be safe. Thank you. Yes.